Hello and welcome to episode 87 part 2 of Awesome Astronomy for September 2019. I might have given the impression at the start of the last episode that I am indifferent to the fate of humanity, that somehow I feel the apex organism of planet Earth is a fat, lazy and stupid creature that would rather hate most of the fellow members of its species and incinerate its own atmosphere than solve problems and move forward. And that impression you had was entirely correct. <laughs> but let us no longer dwell on a world where a man with the power of a US president could propose nuking hurricanes like some sort of modern day King Canute except madder and actually armed with nukes. <laughs> no, let us not dwell on the fact that many thousands of people on hearing that idea thought it might have some merit. For you are, I'm afraid, surrounded by stupid. It haunts us at every turn. Instead, let us look to the world of rockets and spacecraft, of space agencies and exploration. Let us immerse ourselves in self-landing rockets, comet chasers and drones on Titan. For it will be the playboy millionaires of space who will save us rapture-like if we just have faith in their plans to take us off world. Maybe we can all be lifted up from this self-made hell on earth, propelled to a better life among the stars. Why those left behind, those who didn't believe the true faith, those who did not reach deep into their pockets and invest will curse their lack of belief in the earth abandonment fetishists. Talking of fetishists, it's time to meet my co-hosts, the strict and punishing Jenny. Hello darlings. And that gimp to all men, Ralph. Oh, well, hello. Although I have to say that um, if I were a uh, a Bond villain or a um, uh, a sci-fi villain in any way. The only thing I would want to wreak more havoc on mankind than a hurricane would be a radioactive hurricane. Oh, can you imagine? I, I, just, no, do you know what? I can't. I just... Uh, do, uh, do you know what? It, it, there, is, it, there is very little that shocks me about what some of the world's leading politicians now say. Yeah. It, it, we've reached a point where, you know, I, I could you could believe that Boris Johnson would just come on telly and start, like, raping kittens or something. And and people would just go, ah, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> but actually, that was a... There, there was a moment where I, I sort of, you know, turned my phone on in the morning thought, oh, let's have a look at the news. You what? Yeah. Nuke, nuke hurricanes. <laughs> yeah. I will say to his credit that this is something that um, uh, that has been considered since the Eisenhower administration, since nukes came into existence. Um, not very seriously, but it's something that had actually been considered. So somebody that's not used to government and doesn't know a great deal about nukes thinking, we've got a load of nukes, could we nuke a hurricane? Well, stupid um, isn't anything new. Mm. No, it's true. It's true. It's true. It's almost like I mean, you know, I suppose World War One proves we we can be infinitely stupid. Oh yeah, mm. but actually, it's like we invented the nuclear weapon and went, oh, let's turn the stupid up to eleven. Yeah, <laughs> just how stupid can we be? Oh wow, yeah. No, nuclear-powered that, 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 rocket ships, nuclear-powered rockets, nuclear-powered cruise missiles. Yeah. Yeah. Just do anything the nuclear. Answer, yeah, the answer is not always nuclear power. <laughs> no, it has incredibly. its role. <laughs> it has its moments, but when it comes to stopping natural disasters, the answer is rarely nuclear weapons. <laughs> strangely, <laughs> but hey, you know, it'd be worth a trial with something that was uh, that, with a, with a fusion uh, device. But fission? No, 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 no. What what fission doesn't need is erratic winds. <laughs> well, I I just I just love the concept. It's like the the kind of lack of 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 scale. It shows that the the, the dramatic lack of imagination in in most people's <laughs> minds is that they assume nuclear weapons are really really powerful and and massive, not comparable to the size of a hurricane. On a human scale, nuclear weapons are really massive and powerful. But hurricanes are hundreds of miles across. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yep. It's like, you know, I one, feel one like nuke. it might be like like dropping a water balloon into the middle of it. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. I yeah, think exactly. you're right. Yeah, that's a good analogy. Yeah. yeah, it it will it will momentarily sort of you know blast a hole in it. Yeah, 
Oh, well, and then immediately um, the hurricane will just go... And then it'll just be swept away. Yeah. <laughs> you know what it will be like? Shoemaker Levy hitting Jupiter. Hey, exactly. Yeah. expecting exactly. that to get rid of the great red spot. There'll be a little flash. There'll be a little flash of light and some some energy will be released and then it'll go. <laughs> so then it'll, yeah. I, I, it's just... It, it is the lack of, of imagination in the human mind that we assume that the things we build are the biggest and the best. And also, the is it even going to stay on course? Because if they drop it into this hurricane and it's slightly off-centre, this hurricane is just going to whip it in some random direction. Uh, just well, that's the whole point, isn't it? You just throw in nuclear fallout wherever the hurricane goes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's brilliant. Oh, oh, what a good film. Brilliant. What a good show that was. Oh, if, you've, if nobody's watched Chernobyl... Watch Chernobyl. Oh, it's I, the best series I have ever seen. I binged it over the course of 24 hours. Don't watch Chernobyl. It's terrifying because it actually happened. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's brilliant, though. I binged it over 24 hours. Spoiler, they didn't stop the hurricane. No. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing. Mm. Amazing. Yeah, like horrifying. But, but amazing. Right. But amazing, like so well done. I feel. Yeah. Was it? Was it? Do, does either of you want to say amazing again, just before we move on? Amazing. Amazing. Good. There we go. Just, just wanted to make sure that it was that amazing. Right then. Well, it. It's it's time for some some non-nuclear news, really, um, and to start us off with our uh, dive into all that is spaceshipy and shiny and rockets is Jenny. To start us off with our space exploration news, we're heading to the ISS and a massive new upgrade that it's recently undergone. Thanks to the work of two astronauts on their first mission in space, Nick Haig and Drew Morgan, two vehicles can now dock with the ISS at the same time. The new adapter is specifically made for SpaceX and Boeing vehicles, but other companies should be able to make use of it. And the new expansion means that one crew can exit whilst another one enters, making transitions easier. And it also goes without saying that having two emergency exits is better than one. Yep. Mm -hmm. Next, we're staying at the space station and meeting a new robot inhabitant. Mm. Skybot F850. A humanoid robot eventually destined for the floating city. Skybot F850 is the latest version of a series of robots developed to be, well, literally a replacement human, which is actually a bit terrifying. Standing at 180 centimetres tall and weighing about 160 kilos, the robot can perform many tasks that a human can. Identifying objects and tools, navigate obstacles, operate machinery, and drive vehicles. And it can also be controlled by a human wearing a full body suit. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The previous list of things was stuff that it can do autonomously. It can do all those tasks mostly because of its humanoid hands. They've been specifically made to work well with human items. Now, I'm going to say here, Jen, Robonaut. I can't remember when it was, about 2010, 2012. Mm-hmm. This is exactly what the Americans did years ago. Took, took up this robot to, to space yeah, with Robonaut. all of these claims that it'd be able to do all of this stuff as well. Not the, not the mimic what somebody does in a suit, but, but we've never really heard much about it because what can you leave a robot to do in space? No, it, it was returned to Earth. Uh, was uh, it? I can't remember when. You know, was it last year? It might have been the beginning of the end of the year before. It was returned to Earth because it had um, there, were, there was various faults with it and eventually they just returned it to Earth. No, I think it actually developed sentiments. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's when did you see its face, Robonaut? Yeah, it was cool. They, uh, no, it was creepy as. Fuck. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, but can you imagine opening up your your little sleep pod on the ISS and that thing sitting outside staring at you? <laughs> That'd keep you on your game, though, wouldn't it? It's you just, you just there like, hello, Johnny. How did yeah. you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if it had the kind of cutesy face that Japanese robots have. You wouldn't want that's that in cr- space. You want something that makes you realise if you're not on your game, it's going to kill you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Robonaut did look like it would strangle you in your sleep. Yeah. It, it's got this completely impassive gold visor face. And you can imagine opening up and like, good morning, Major Hadfield. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
I'm sorry, <laughs> I can't do that, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I don't know about that stuff, but I know that the plan for this new robot was pretty straightforward. The plan was get to the ISS, act as a social companion for the human crew on board, act as a reference manual, so literally like an Alexa that we have, they would just ask the robot if they need to know something about uh, the functionality of the space station, and then go back home after a couple of weeks. And then eventually it'll be used to do tasks that could be dangerous for humans, so you know if there's like a, a risk of radiation exposure or, or something like that. And how did it go? Yeah. Well... It didn't get there. <laughs> yeah, slight Daring spanning lies works. To Rob. <laughs> uh, the Soyuz spacecraft. So as we're recording, uh, launched a few days ago, and when it got to the space station, it was forced to abort its docking attempt because of a rendezvous system malfunction. Um, as we're recording, they are going to make more attempts to dock with the ISS. Um, with the next one, it is imminent. Um, Hopefully it'll work because there's not only the robot on board the spacecraft, uh, but also over 600 kilos of supplies for the crew. So, you know, kind of some important stuff on board. There doesn't seem to be too much concern, though, about this malfunction. Uh, The most popular reason behind the failed docking is a bad signal amplifier, which can be replaced or fixed on board the ISS before the next attempt happens. So... I think this is something that's happened before. They don't seem too worried about it. They're just going to try again. Basically, they can if something fails to dock, um, they give it 24 hours and then the space station and and the thing that's trying to dock will be aligned up again, ready to reattempt the docking. And because there's no people on board, there's not too much of a panic to try and quickly get people on the space station because it's an unmanned spacecraft. The robot is acting as the human, which is also quite interesting. So the the robot when it was on board was sort of giving all the readings and informing the ground sort of what would happen what's going on with like the spacecraft you know if there are any alarms going mm. off it's giving readings things like that actually the the latest just because i thought i do you know what we've been recording for a couple of hours and i thought i should get an update Ooh. actually just as we've been recording they've actually moved um uh russian um crew have gone on board their soyuz ms-13 undocked it and moved it to another docking um, position yeah. and redocked allowing this their um, working docking port to then be used for MS-14 which is the, the uncrewed one that's uh, waiting next to the station um, and they're hoping to try that tonight um, but yeah they actually they, they manually docked on the the not working the wow, um, that's, docking that's cool. docking so they, they pulled their one out, moved it around the space station, docked it next to it. So, yeah, hopefully they, they should get that in. I was just, just getting an update. Just Bad. sent you an image on uh, via the Kushner Back channel, guys. You think Robonaut was scary looking? This one's terrifying, isn't it? Did you see it firing pistols the other day? <gasps> oh, just because it's not scary enough? They, they, there is a video of this, this Russian robot on a gun range firing pistols. Yeah, I wasn't going to bring that up as soon as you mention it. It's like that. That's not scary at all. Like it's got it's got a pistol in each hand and it's just like gunning for it. Yeah, blasting away on a range. Yeah, but they insist that it's not a you know, what's the word? Breaching the space act. I keep thinking military. Yes, it's it's not a military piece of machinery, even though it can fire a gun. That was only to demonstrate the dexterity of its hands and its capabilities. But seriously. But it's definitely not a military robot at all. But don't get it angry. You wouldn't like it when it's angry. Mm. And it can shoot. And it can shoot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, it's not enough to start drilling holes in spacecraft. Now they're sending shooting robots up there. Yeah. Pew, pew. Yeah. Pew, pew. Guns don't kill people. Robots with f***ing pistols kill people. <laughs> 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 Right, next. Next, indeed, is unfortunately another bit of bad news because it's another failure. No. This time, it's ExoMars because oh, it's no. failed another parachute test. Oh, the great Wee. European hope to be yeah. the Americans to find in life on Mars. Mm-hmm. This is just the latest in a series of parachute test failures and the repeated mishaps are putting the 2020 launch date at risk. ExoMars is a two-part mission. First half was launched some three years ago and has had its own shares of highs and lows. First half successfully put the Trace Gas Orbiter into orbit around Mars 
and was also supposed to safely land uh, Chaparelli on the surface. But unfortunately, uh, Chaparelli crash landed on the surface. And uh, mm. it looks like the second part may end up with the same fate unless oh, Issa oh. and Ross Cosmos can figure things out. Mm. Now, landing on Mars is hard because Mars is a pretty large planet as you know, rocky planets go. So it has a reasonably large gravitational pull, which means anything flying through the atmosphere accelerates quickly to high speeds. But Mars' atmosphere is very thin, and this means braking is hard to do effectively. The second part of the ExoMars mission involves the recently named Rosalind Franklin rover and a lander called Kazachok. And together, they weigh some 1,800 kilos, which is some wow. serious slowing down that needs to happen, mm. right? Mm. So although the parachute system seems to work at low altitude, at high altitude, the system develops tears. They're and only just finding this out now? Well, yep. the first time they tried at high altitude, they got tears. That was a few months ago. So they went away, thought they'd fixed it. They've now done the second test and they're still getting these tears. Put a bit of gaffer tape on it. Yeah. Just make it out of gaffer tape. Yeah. Yeah. So to try and figure out what's going on, they're holding a workshop in September um, and they're going to try and get some people from NASA to go to that who have got previous experience of landing rovers on Mars to try and figure out what the hell's going on with this parachute. <laughs> you, could, you could just imagine what those guys were walking into the room going... Oh, they're going to be swaggering in, aren't they? Oh, you mean you've never landed anything on Mars successfully? Mm -hmm. Ah, we might be able to help you. Yeah, and then they're going to do another test then later in the year after the workshop. But if that final test doesn't work, you can absolutely kiss goodbye to the August 2020 launch date. And then, because of the yeah. alignment of the Earth-Mars system, it's going to be a while before a good launch window will open up again. And if Mars 2020 finds life on Mars, it ain't even going to launch. Uh, do you know what? It, there's a very good chance there was um, dipping into the old rumour rumor control headquarters um, that if, if this parachute test fails and the launch is delayed, it will never launch, yeah. mm. just regardless, because ESA does not have the funding to keep the thing alive and ticking over and in, in a state to launch for essentially what could be a couple of years. Yep. So, yeah, that that could be the... Uh, the Rosalind Franklin could, could be a museum not, piece. Yep, may not even get there. So, yeah, it's uh, yeah. dodgy times. But we'll yep. end on a high note with a very short update about Europa Clipper. Mm. which, unlike ExoMars, looks like it'll meet its mid-2020s launch window. Mm. This is an exciting one. Yep. NASA has given the thumbs up for the final design phase and then construction to begin. Europa Clipper is going to study Europa, one of the largest moons of Jupiter, and evaluate its habitability, particularly focusing on characterising its subsurface ocean and hunting for good landing spots for other life-hunting missions. Woot, woot. Mm. I'm looking forward to this mission. Yeah. So, but it's a very mixed bag of news so far. I'm, I'm just, I'm just gonna um, add in there that what people forget also is that European Space Agency also has a mission doing pretty much the same thing called Juice. Yes, it does. Yeah. And that, in fact, it's doing that, more because it's going to all of the icy yeah. rings. And that's launching in 2022, and it's in the build right now. Mm. So it's actually ahead of the game on that one. Yeah, and then something will tear on that, and it won't go either. <laughs> <laughs> right then so that's Jenny's uh, little roundup. Ralph what have you got for us well if you've not been keeping up with advancements in NASA's project Artemis to return to the moon for a permanent presence there and then onto Mars this is the place for you because things are really hotting up with big consequential announcements almost every week on how they're going to achieve this and what they're physically doing and first up is NASA's plans for a lunar lander. The space launch system is the big rocket that's almost completed. Orion's the crew capsule that's now signed off and ready to launch. But the one sticking point was how are NASA going to develop the lunar gateway, that staging platform orbiting the moon, and a lunar lander without extra funds from Congress? Well, Administrator Jim Bridenstine has tasked NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, where Werner Von Braun developed the Saturn V, 
to lead the Lunar Lander Program, and Johnson Space Flight Center, where Mission Control and Astronaut Ops are based, will lead the Lunar Gateway Program. And for both of these critical pieces, engagement with U.S. companies, including those that are already developing commercial spacecraft, seems to be the way to accelerate this. This also has the additional benefit of keeping costs down, as, just for example, SpaceX developed their Falcon Heavy rocket on private capital of around $600 million, while so far... NASA's SLS rocket has cost the American taxpayer 23 times that much. And Bridenstine estimates that 90% of the work on Project Artemis is already done now. So that begs the question, how much is left to do for the lander and for the gateway? And a lot of this is going to come into the technology that's being developed now, because just like Apollo in the 1960s, there's a lot of tech development needed to prove the way. Technology is far more advanced today than in the 60s, so we can do more preparation to reduce risk and increase the likelihood of having that moon base or footprints on Mars in the next 15 years. And just this month, we had an announcement of the tech companies pairing up with NASA to develop the tech for safely and sustainably going to the moon and Mars. So we have two companies developing lunar navigation and CubeSat radio transponders to support lunar exploration and communication relays. We have three companies developing advanced materials for lightweight rocket fairings, metal powders for high temperature environments, which I think is advanced 3D printing, but I'm not certain, and friction stir welding to reduce the likelihood to reduce the likelihood of defects when manufacturing rocket stages. We have six companies developing entry, descent and landing technologies, two to test inflating and carbon fabric heat shields to help deliver larger payloads to Mars. The familiar company Sierra Nevada, who developed the Dream Chaser space shuttle, will capture supersonic thermal imagery of their shuttle and mature their method to recover the upper stage of a rocket using a deployable decelerator. Blue Origin will mature their navigation and guidance system for safe and precise landing at a range of locations on the moon. They'll evaluate and mature high temperature materials for liquid rocket engine nozzles that could be used on lunar landers. And they'll mature their fuel cell power system for the company's Blue Moon lander to provide uninterrupted power during the lunar night, which you'll remember lasts for about two weeks in most locations on the moon. SpaceX are being funded to advance their technology to vertically land large rockets on the moon and advance technology needed to transfer propellant in orbit, which is an important step in the development of the company's Starship space vehicle, but also getting NASA's payloads to further locations like Mars and beyond. While Lockheed Martin will test in-space plant growth systems because integrating robotics with plant systems could help NASA harvest plants in deep space both on Mars and the moon and on the way to Mars. So this is the latest round of technologies that NASA are funding to increase the commercial spaceflight options they have to achieve this Moon and Mars plan. And there's a lot of money they're putting out there to some really Mm -hmm. reputable companies, which really opens up some options. You know, if you've got Blue Origin landers and SpaceX landers Mm -hmm. being developed, you're really opening up your... The, the potential options at a much lower cost than they've historically been in the past. So, you know, I told it, you things were hotting up. I, it's going to be, do you know, American space is going to be a really incredible place over the next two, three mm. years. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, the we had the big announcement from Sierra, Sierra Nevada um, and what was the rocket company? ULA. You know, the, the, the new, their new uh, Vulcan rocket. So you had the, the announcement of with Sierra, Sierra Nevada and ULA coming together to um, they're going to launch the Dream Chaser on on the new um, Vulcan rocket. Yeah. Um, that's that's and that's sort of coming soon, um, and they're going to be flying to the ISS. So that that's about to kick off, and that's initially going to be freight, but there's going to be people eventually, and they're mm. keeping a European option open on that. And you've got hopefully Dragon Two and the Starliner about to launch people. There was the promise that they're going to launch people by the end of the year. Mm. And then there's all this. Yeah. It, it, it's it's feast or famine. It's coming together really well. It's a, it's a really good working synergy because you've got all these companies that want to be able mm. to develop their own technologies, largely for commercial endeavours and, and in some cases Elon Musk's own maniacal plans. But also it has that advantage of being able to be developed by NASA or, or funded by NASA with the expertise that NASA have got to develop core components that – both help that company for their own commercial plans, but also mm. means that these things get developed so much faster and so much more cheaply than if they use their old traditional contracting methods. 
Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, I would say it's, it's that feast or famine. We've had, you know, the sort of famine of of no American crewed launches since the, the, the end of the space shuttle. Mm. And then suddenly we, we are... It's just exploded, isn't it? Multiple capsules, space stations and, and landing on the moon. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, it's incredible. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if every month all I'm doing is just giving updates on Project Artemis because <laughs> I think mm. coming over, over the next year or two... Yeah. Um, maybe well, if, even all if, the way up to 2024 if, if things continue the way they are. It's just going to be building and building and building all the time. Yeah, well, I mean, if, if it's going to happen, you should be giving an update every month yeah. because it has the to. kind of... Yeah, yeah the, 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 the deadline they've set themselves, they got it's got to be this kind of very, very quick. It's, it's 2020 and in less than... What are we now? September. Mm-hmm. They, they want to land by 2024 mm. <laughs> it's just over four years yep so yeah cool right then so our, our little discussion point um, is well it's I have to say when I was putting this script together I was at first going to ignore this <laughs> I know what you mean the, 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 the sort of I, I'm, I'm very anti-gossip and tittle-tattle but you then read the story and you thought, actually, do you know what? This this could be one of those those markers in, in the kind of history of space flight and everything that that will be there if mm. this is proved to be so. And of course what I'm talking about, and lots of people probably guessed, is the first crime in space. Da, da, da. The first the first reported crime in space. Yes, mm. yes. Let's go. The first allegation of crime in space. Nothing, of course, is you know guilty and mm-hmm. guilty and to improved innocent and all that. Yeah. Um. So, who's going to take me? Th- who, who wants to run me through the allegation? What has happened? I'll do it if you like. Inspector Knacker of the Yard, give us give us the rundown. <laughs> Yeah, so the accused is Anne McLean, astronaut, and is accused of accessing the bank account of her estranged spouse from the space station. Mm. Which is a crime. Yes. Yeah. And because it was actually her spouse that uh, that reported this. So, I mean, it's very difficult to deny it, really. Uh, she's not denying it, but yes, to say that it's just an alleged crime is actually understating it. It is actually a crime. What she's what she's done is a crime, and the yeah. evidence is there because it's using the uh, the internet on the uh, on the international on space, station. space station, which yeah. is yeah. recorded. So because it did happen. yeah, they, <laughs> it, it basically the, the the account was accessed when they looked into it. The account was accessed from two servers at NASA, and they were like, um, "Oh, hang on!" But of course. The, the person doing it wasn't on Earth at the time. Yeah. <laughs> they were on the ISS. Um, and, yeah, she hasn't actually denied accessing these accounts. So, um, yeah, this is an interesting one. Mm. And this was all about family split and all the rest of it and money for children and all the rest of it. Without getting into the ins and outs of that, what's more interesting is this is the first allegation of a crime committed off Earth in space. Yeah. Um, this will be that pub quiz question in a few years' time. Mm. So, what are the ins and outs of it? Because, well, basically, what's what's the jurisdiction? What's mm. what's what's going to happen? Yeah, this is this is all settled stuff. So basically, it's all carved out. As in, if you're an astronaut from a country and everybody belongs, uh, everybody has citizenship of a country, um, then the rules of that country apply when you're in space. So if you commit a crime that is a crime in your home country, it's dealt with in the way that that it is in that country. So she will be she will be dealt with um, under American law. Um, and um, I, I, my personal guess is that this will all be sorted out, and the the partner, the the, the ex spouse, will uh, drop the allegations or, or drop the charges against her. Um, but she could well prosecute if she wants to. Um, and it's uh, it's pretty much an open and shut case, even though if as Anne McLean says. It was purely altruistic. She was making sure there was enough money um, for 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 their son, enough money to be able to deal with all the affairs on Earth while she's away. 
then you know it's probably an altruistic reason for doing that but it is still a crime so if they wish to pursue that allegation then you know she will be dealt with under american law but that what this leads us on to is if there are crimes that happen in space in the future and as we expand space and we have longer mm. duration missions in space you may find psychoses happening with people people falling out in space there may mm. be assaults there may be uh, attacks in space there may be uh, thefts that happen in space when you've got commercial um, space travel so what will happen is under current law unless things get more complicated and the law needs to be changed whoever is the perpetrator of the offence will be dealt with under the existing law of that country even though they're not in that country at the time Mm. Because uh, the, there's there's some other the, I was looking into um, if if you go onto the European Space Agency's website they they have the the sort of legal framework for for the ISS. Oh, do they? Yeah. So they they've they've sort of put it out like what what is basically the, the sort of various obligations, uh, and it's a huge document. There's there's loads in there, but you sort of skim skimming through. There's things like the um, the sort of laws that apply on the space station are the laws of the countries that are signed that signed up to the space station in the first place so actually i i have a a question about sort of astronauts that don't come from those those countries those signatory countries so of course it's it's clear cut if it's a russian astronaut american astronaut canadian japanese european ones is actually interesting because of course not all the countries that signed up to the ISS and funded it and are part of the original agreement um, are the, the nationalities of the, the astronauts that go. So, for instance, Britain being a prime example, Britain isn't a, a, a original signatory of that legal framework. Oh, yeah. So uh, I actually was was curious myself. I, know, I don't know if people out there know. I've, I've been digging around trying to find out. And I'm going to ask someone. This has been bank holiday weekend while I've been looking at this. Um about sort of you know if Tim Peake had committed a crime on the space station, whose law would he actually fall under? Would he fall under British law, or European or law, or default to American law? Fall, would it fall under um, German law, for instance, where the the astronaut the European astronaut corps is based, mm. or Dutch law, where Es Tech and basically sort of what if we tweet him right now? Yeah, I, well, do you know what? Actually, funny enough, he, do you see he did answer a question that we um, we put out. Well, let's tweet. I'm going to tweet him now, and let's see if he gives us an answer by the end of the show. There we go. Ask, ask him if you had murdered someone on the space station. Who would have? Who would have hit you? Where would you have hit the body? Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Who would it have been? <laughs> yeah, which which of the other five would it have been? <laughs> um, that, that was interesting, and also there's the possibility of extradition. So, of course, if say an American astronaut attacked a Russian astronaut. Who who does who does the punishing? Who does you know? So you know, would the Americans not bother? Blah, blah, blah. So there is a possibility. There is a framework to extradite. Yeah. Um, and in terms of property damage and theft and things like that, there is also um, sort of various um, sort of legal issues about where it happens in the space station because of course the different parts of the space station are owned by different countries so you know if it happens in the jackson module it's 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 in it's essentially on japanese territory um if it happens in the russian modules it's essentially on russian territory um if it happens in the european module of course it gets more complex because it european space agency represents lots of different countries but it's based on those those I think it's 14 of the countries that signed up as the, the sort of legal framework. So it's actually, it, it, it can get quite complex, I think. And if when, when you get into, this one's very clear cut, but when it gets into, you know, if there were a crime that happened that involves more than one nationality and it's where it is in the space station and who did what, actually it could get quite complicated. And as for the extradition bit, I mean, Julian Assange got the, uh, the embassy a packet if you're sat up there in space, you're going, no, I'm not coming down. No, no, no I'm not doing I ain't coming. I ain't coming. I'm it's going to be difficult to send the marshals up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not coming. I'm not coming. I, I, I believe they do have the ability to tranquilize and things like that. I, I <laughs> Well, they do know that Robocop's oh. up there. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. He'll just, just wrestle them into the capsule yeah. with his pistols. 
So I've just sent a, a tweet to Tim Peake saying, we're recording a piece on space law relating to Anne McLean on the show right now. If you'd committed a crime on the ISS, we're not judging, under what jurisdiction would you fall? UK, Germany, Holland. Nice. Yeah. Let's see if go. it gets back to us. See if it gets back to us. He, he, he replied, did you see, um, he replied to our, um, a, a listener, um, asked us a question a little while ago. Um, and so we, we just asked him, I, I copied him into the tweet and he, it was about when you take your sock off, of course you get sock dust. Yep. Yep. Well, we all have experienced that and that explosion of sock dust when you take your sock off. And he said, how do you deal with that in space? Don't take your socks off. And well, actually what peaks, we, we, we sort of copied Tim in and he replied really quickly and he said, actually, he said, it, it, it's not for the faint hearted because you're not walking in space the bottoms of, of your feet don't wear away. So you get this massive build-up of dead skin on the bottom of your feet oh. that then explodes everywhere oh. and, and peels off. Mm. And he says, and so he says you get you get a great... Um, what was the... Uh, when you have your feet sandpapered? Uh, what's it called? Um, pedicure? Pedicure. The pedicure. He says you get an amazing pedicure... But it really is pretty nasty. Oh, <laughs> it's, like, it's like those uh, socks that people put on their feet and then their feet all peel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you seen yeah, those? It's, it's, it's got to be like that, yeah. isn't it? It is. Well, it, it, and you realise it's because on Earth you're, you're constantly walking on your feet, so it's compacting the skin and it's wearing away. Yeah. Well, of course, if you're just floating around, it all just kind of the, the layers aren't being compacted anymore. It all starts to peel off. Well, and, it's no longer, you don't need it. There's nothing wearing on it to to peel it off either, so it builds up. And yeah, I was like, that's amazingly grim and a brilliant space fact. Um, yeah, I love stuff like that. But yeah, so uh, let us know if you reply. Do you reckon they tell them, they warn them about that sort of stuff before they go? Out? Do you know what? That was I wanted that to be a follow up question. I was if, uh, to ask him is like, is that something they tell you before you go, or do they just let you discover that? Yeah, and you're just there, like you take your socks off one day, and then suddenly it's snowing. Yeah, suddenly you're covered in your dead skin going, oh. well, that's that's grand. <laughs> you're going, you're going, you said, you said, what the shit? And they're like, oh, yeah, forgot to tell you about that. Sorry. You've just discovered the foot skin thing. Welcome to space. Yeah. Right, who had two weeks? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Right. Who do you reckon you would have murdered on the ISS out of the other five? Robocop. Ah, uh, yeah, you probably yeah, you just destroyed um, Robonaut. Mm. Right then, so it's debate time, people. Okay, order, order, please. Right, the court is now in session. For the best space mission, um, next up we have the discussion, the debate between Spirit and Opportunity, I believe, which are Mars landers, Mars rovers. Well, I've, hang on, I've just focused on Opportunity because uh, sorry, just appro in back. Approach, approach the bench. Oh, I do apologise, my lord. Right, right. Uh, are you saying you've discounted half the mission? Well, to be fair, in our Facebook chat, you just said opportunity in Voyager, so that's what I went for. Right, okay, so stay, that's fine, let's carry on. <laughs> um, and and uh, I believe uh, this is going up against a, a programme called Voyager. It is, my lord. It is, right, okay, um, and who's to start? Uh, if it please, my lord, and honoured members of the jury, I will present my case for opportunity first as the best space mission of all time. Carry on, make it good. Opportunity, affectionately known by people everywhere as Oppie, was launched some 16 years ago in July 2003. She was shortly followed by her sister, Spirit. Landing on opposite sides of the red planet, cocooned by bubbles of air, the pair began exploring and exploring and exploring. Slated to last a measly three months, Opportunity trundles about for a staggering 173, or 14 and a half years. Let that sink in. 14 
and a half years. That's the time difference across four Olympic Games or more than three presidential terms. It all adds up to one incredible life. Has there ever been such an overachieving mission? You'll be hard pressed to find one to beat her. During her time on Mars, Opportunity covered over 28 miles. That's more than a marathon. Her goal? Singular. Determine if life as we know it could have ever existed on the surface of the red planet. And boy, did she deliver. Just six weeks after landing, Opportunity found a rocky outcrop containing sulphates and crystals, undoubtable signs of water. In the same month, she found chlorine and bromine, evidence of past salty water. All this during its planned mission time. But that mission deadline came and went. And so Opportunity left Eagle Crater, where she had landed, and trundled onwards to Endurance Crater, where she persisted, and once again found more evidence of water. And so Opportunity went on, mile after mile, escaping entrapment in sand dunes and battling dust storms, ploughing into craters without knowing if she would ever escape, proving, without a shadow of a doubt, that the Mars of the past was wet, and so life could have existed here. But the golf cart-sized opportunity gave us so much more beyond confirming the past existence of water on Mars. Opportunity did as her name suggested, and seized the moment whenever she could. Opportunity found the first ever meteorite discovered on another planet. She watched dust devils swirl by. She measured the atmosphere. She sent back panoramic coloured images of an alien world. She imaged comets as they sailed by. She watched the sun rise and set 5,000 times. Above all, Opportunity captured the imagination of the public by showing us the beauty of Mars. Over 340,000 images and 31 360-degree panoramic shots showed Mars not as a dead world, but a dynamic and evolving place. A planet with rippled sand dunes blueberry-like rocks, violent dust storms, and ancient, cracked riverbeds. Opportunity was simply an inspiration to the world. She inspired artists who made countless comic strips of her seemingly never-ending escapades across the dusty planet. She inspired NASA to return to Mars and laid the path for future rovers like Curiosity and Rosalind Franklin. She inspired the world and showed us that giving up is not an option. Wait for the storm to pass. Drive in reverse if you have to. But never stop. Never give in. She was the rover that could. She was the rover that did. Cool. And thank you very much for that. Um, uh, approach the bench, Ralph, and uh, give us your best. My lord and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I don't intend to blind and bamboozle you with the anthropomorphic arguments of how plucky these machines are to work for decades in the harsh environments of deep space or the intense radiation of the Jupiter system, nor how it was constructed in super quick time to meet a once in three lifetimes alignment of the planet, allowing them to visit every unknown world in our solar system. That's a testament to the human ingenuity and their engineering, not a trait or characteristic of the spacecraft itself. No, I'm here to appeal to the simply unimaginable science and human knowledge that the Voyager spacecraft gathered, and is still gathering. Using 1960s and 70s technology and a computer that your remote control wouldn't even recognise as a computer, it recorded data on tape, transmitted it back at rates that would frustrate a porn consumer using dial-up, then re-recorded over that tape to repeat and repeat and repeat for 42 years and counting. Sending information gathered from primitive visible and ultraviolet light cameras to show us breathtaking and magnificent new worlds in unprecedented detail, infrared and an ultraviolet spectrometer to teach us about planetary atmospherics, 
radio analysis to show the physical properties of planets and their moons, ionospheres, atmospheres, masses, gravity fields, densities and ring systems, a magnetometer to reveal planetary magnetic fields, the effect of the solar wind and the conditions outside our solar system, a cosmic ray system to reveal the origin and acceleration process, life history and dynamism of interstellar cosmic rays, a radio astronomy receiver to study the radio emission signals from Jupiter and Saturn, a photopolarimeter to gather information on the surface textures of dozens of moons, composition of Jupiter and Saturn and the density of those planets, and a plasma wave detector to study planetary magnetospheres. And what did these primitive instruments show us about our solar system as the identical Voyager spacecraft were sent on different paths through the outer solar system? Let me put it this way. They revealed infinitely more about Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune and their systems than we could even think to ask. We still use their data now. It gives us today the only close-up data humanity has ever got from the Uranus and Neptune systems or the heliosphere beyond the sun's influence. Almost everything we still know about the Uranian and Neptunian systems comes from Voyager data. Absolutely everything we know about the conditions in the interstellar medium comes from Voyager data. It gave us our first close-up views of all those worlds, and they absolutely astounded us, not the dull gas worlds we expected at all. Voyager led to the commissioning of Galileo and Cassini to go back for an extended stay at Jupiter and Saturn. The Voyagers revealed Jupiter's turbulent atmosphere with dozens of interacting hurricane-like storm systems, erupting volcanoes on Jupiter's moon Io with 100 times the volcanic activity of Earth. The presence of oceans beneath the icy crusts of Jupiter's moons Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. Voyager 2 alone took over 17,000 images of Jupiter and its moons as it flew past. They revealed the complexity and beauty of Saturn's rings, a deep nitrogen atmosphere on Saturn's moon Titan with clouds and rain of methane, a complex and diverse surface on frozen moons shaped by icy volcanism, that Uranus's poles are perpendicular to the norm suggesting it's been knocked over, Neptune's great dark spot and 1,000 miles an hour winds. Geysers erupting from the polar cap on Neptune's moon Triton at minus 390 degrees Fahrenheit. Rings around Jupiter, Uranus and Neptune. The termination shock where the supersonic wind slows and then gives way to the interstellar wind, marking the final frontier of the solar system. They discovered several new moons around Saturn and Jupiter, 11 around Uranus, 6 around Neptune. Ladies and gentlemen, Voyager is not only a greater space mission than any of the Mars rovers. Its phenomenal insight and data collection from Jupiter to beyond the Sun's electromagnetic influence makes Voyager, beyond question, the greatest space mission there has ever been or there is likely to ever be in the next 50 years or more. Both Voyager 1 and 2 are not only stellar, they're interstellar. Ooh, mic drop. <laughs> well, um, I'd like to say that um, it was an equal, uh, equal fight. But mm, it's not an equal fight. It's fine. It, you can it, say it. It, it. it it never was going to be. Um, it, it's there's nothing more I need to say really after all that. It, it's going to be oppor- I mean, it's going to be void. <laughs> <laughs> it's. Yeah, I'm afraid it's got to be Voyager. Oh no, I agree. Got you with that last line, didn't I? Uh, you got you got me all the way through, mate. That that was just. just I was. That was. That was. That was stirring stuff. Very well done. I just re- just reminding uh, just the sheer size of that mission and the fact that it's still going building that in a hurry and just lighting it up like a christmas tree with instruments mm. just and then just flinging it out and just seeing uh, ringing everything they could possibly get out of that mission yeah, yeah, yeah. and just tweaking it as it went along where, where are we going to go next titan or off to uranus or yeah. what are we going to do exactly it's massive just amazing massive comms dish power source packet full of instruments yeah. wham off it goes and, yeah, and it's, it's actually surprising we've not done something similar since. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, I mean, I suppose. It well, was I reckon that, you that said op- the reason right at the start is the whole alignment issue, right? Yeah. Of course, yes. Of course, I was, it is, I was about yeah. to say that. Yeah, yeah the, the planetary alignment thing was just that, that gift. 
and they went for it. But that said, there is no reason that that a similar up to date mission couldn't be sent on. I mean, in a way, New Horizons was um, a, a sort of Voyager descendant, but it just had a single target. Yeah, because you you use planetary assists mm. to be able to um, to be able to you know get your speed to fling yourself out yeah. of the solar system. So and, and Cassini- each planetary assist is a flyby of a planet. Yeah, and and you meant you, Cassini and Galileo were again those similar you know big dish power source packet full of instruments mm. get it there see what it does they just were focusing yeah. on a single planet whereas Voyager is just this epic kind of journey isn't it yeah. Um, it's in in our big final when 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 we get to the finals and the the, the ah, voyage is going to be a tough one to beat, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, it is. It, yeah, it, it, it is. I mean, it, you would be daft not to already thinking that that's got a good shout to be be top. Yeah, yeah. Okay then. That's us done for another month. Now I'm off to propose the release of Novichok in an attempt to prevent earthquakes. And don't forget that you can get hold of us to steer the ship with your thoughts on the show or astronomy in general, or even pose us a question for the Q&A segment. There are no stupid questions, and there's always someone who will benefit from even the simplest questions or answers to the simplest questions. Tweet us at AwesomeAstropod or send us an email for thoughts worth more than 280 characters to the show at AwesomeAstronomy.com. And as always... We're only in it for the love. So tell us you like us, tweet about us, shout about us on Facebook, leave us a review somewhere. Please make us smile. Yeah, you miserable bastards, get out there and do it. So, until next time, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science, and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions, or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod, or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission.